What in the world was John talking about in the Gospel of John? That's what we're going to talk about today in John 1. All right, it is not as much fun to say John 1 as it is to say Luke 1 or Mark 1. Like kind of rolls off his tongue a little bit differently. But we're going to talk about John and what it is John is talking about. He is a trippy guy, but you all can disagree with me that John probably was just a different egg. John was considered to be the apostle that Jesus loved. He was the son of Zebedee. So he had John and James that Jesus picks from Galilee to be his disciples. That was like three and four. This is who it is. We think it is. Some people thought there was like a John the Elder, but they tossed that away as being the theory of who wrote John because he talks about the things that John was at. There are church fathers who were taught by John, because remember, John outlived the other apostles and was eventually banished to the island of Patmos. And so we have fathers of the church who were taught by John and said he wrote this book. He says that he wrote this book to persuade people to believe in Jesus. That was the beginning of the entire story. And we're going to hear stories that are unique to John. He starts out earlier in some of the stories, earlier than where the other apostles start kicking off stories. And so we hear a little bit more about the calling of apostles. And the point of John is so that people will believe in Jesus. This one is called the spiritual gospel. Someone said, this is the, like I called it trippy, but I think that he's the philosopher, right? He's the one who's going to tell the gospel. He's the one who's going to explain what all of this even means. Matthew is talking to Jewish people saying, this is the fulfillment of prophecy. Mark is like, this is action Jesus. This is the bearer things that you need to know about Jesus. You don't want to hear about all this other stuff. Luke, beautifully written, a beautiful story that he was trying to help the young Gentile believers understand more about Jesus. John wants us to understand who is God? Who is Jesus? What do they want from us? What do they want to do? Where did all of them come from? They think that the Gospel of John was written somewhere around 100 AD. John died of old age, and so he had a lot of time to think about it. I was joking with my friend that the Gospel of John is what you write when you've been on an island by yourself for way too long and you had all this time to think about what just happened. You know, like if you're in the heat of things, like Peter and and the other apostles, and you're just jotting things down and getting them down on paper, Oh, okay, this happened and then this happened and this happened. But if you're sitting on an island by yourself for all these years, you got a lot of thinking time. And this is what you get when you're talking about the thinking time. So the first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are synoptic, meaning C together. Synoptic optic is the C, right? And sin is like synchronized. So they all seem similar. They have a similar format. John is different because he is going to talk about miracles. He he has seven miracles, which six of them were not mentioned in the other Gospels. He's going to have the seven I am statements. We're going to talk more about I am. And then he's going to talk about the purpose, why it is we should believe. What did it mean for God to come here and talk to us? Our oldest fragment of the Gospel of John is John 18, found in Egypt, and it said it was well before 150 AD. So this is going to be very close, if not at the time John was still alive. I know that when you become a Christian, a lot of people tell you that if you want to get the gist and understand the point of Christianity, you read the Gospel of John. But I was also reading some of the commentaries, and one of the people said, I wish I loved John. It took me a long time to love John. I spent my first years in seminary trying to understand what in the world he's talking about. 
And it was frustrating. He says, I understand why people love Mark and they love Luke and they love Matthew, but John, ugh. And he prayed really hard so that he would finally get it. And after years of study, he finally understood what John was about. And the important part that John is getting at is so that we know and believe. That's the idea. And I think, too, that we act. We know Jesus. We believe in Jesus. And then we act. We express action based on our knowledge and belief. Some of the commentaries I'm using are a series of Bible studies that comes from InterVarsity Press. Again, I used to work for InterVarsity, and they have a series of Bible studies on each of the chapters of the Bible. I read the one from that I said I liked from the last one about Luke. This is the continuation written by different authors of this one. And the Cornerstone Commentary, the People's Bible, John Guzak and his commentary as well as some YouTube videos that I really like. There's a fellow who does a YouTube channel called The Beat. Fantastic. I don't know if he's a pastor. I know he studied at seminary, but just this amazing viewpoint on the Bible itself. I also listen to Father Mike Schmitz and his Year in the Bible podcast, as well as some YouTube videos. Terry Lee Cobble does a yearly Bible as well. You know, so that's the entire Bible in a year. And then videos from the Bible Project, all fantastic resources, and as well as Matthew Henry. You can tell why these podcasts take so long. So, like I said, I sort of read each of the stories. I try to get my vibe about what it's about. And then I go to the commentaries, the videos, the various speakers about the Bible and try to learn a little bit more to see if I'm on the right track. Sometimes my opinion of it, I'm, I might be wrong. And so I try to find out what it is that people who are educated in the Bible think about a particular chapter. But let's get to John. Um, I've heard quite a few people discuss John in a sense of faith decisions is one way people put it, but dramas. He's basically bringing people to a point where they have to decide on rebellion. I'm going to follow my own way. I know better. I'm prideful. I understand more than you do kind of thing. Or people who fell into faith and followed Jesus when he called them to follow. That It's always going to be the struggle in John of people going one direction or another. And John is good at talking about Jesus' humanity. I mean, we forget he was really human. When he fasted in the desert for 40 days, that's as a human. Imagine what you would feel like if you fasted in a desert for 40 days a human person. When he took on the crucifixion, human. But his divinity, his revelation as God is a part of him too. And so that's where John is really going to contrast these two ideas of Jesus as a man, Jesus as a Messiah, and Jesus as God there from the very beginning. See, I'm already nine minutes in. We haven't talked about it. So let's talk about John itself. We start off, John, right at the beginning. Philosophical. In, in the beginning was the Word with a capital W, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. And he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, not anything was made. So he contrasts the two thoughts. Not only is everything made, but there was nothing that was not made through him. He was the light of men, the light that shines in the darkness that in the darkness hasn't overcome. Then there was the man that God sent named John, as John the Baptist, came to bear witness. He was not the light, he was not the Messiah, not the Jesus, but he was to bear witness about the light. This is true light, John says, that gives light to everything in the world. Jesus, and we'll see more of it, always talks about the light. You don't hide light under a basket. The eyes are the light of your soul. Are you going to be in the light or are you going to be in the dark? Now we know Jesus is the light that cannot be overcome by darkness. This idea of Jesus and his parables of light and darkness, he is the light of the world. He is the true light. The Gospel of John says that. He came here and the world didn't receive him, didn't accept him, didn't take him in. But those who did receive him and believed in him became children of God. 
born not of blood, not of flesh, but of God. We became the children of God by accepting Jesus into this. And when it said that the word, with the capital W, someone said that this represents the wisdom of God. The word of God was the wisdom of God, became flesh, dwelled among us, full of grace and truth. And that John the Baptist cried out to people and said, I'm not that person, but the one who comes after me is that person. And we'll see that in the next few chapters. Because the law of Moses, race and truth, came through Jesus Christ. So like I said, John had a lot of time to organize his thoughts about all of this. And this is something else, you know, that we got this idea that Jesus was there from the beginning. This wasn't like a phase God was going through and said, okay, well, now I have to send someone to save mankind's soul and pay for the sins. And so I'm going to develop Jesus. Jesus was there from the very beginning but was incarnate, was made into human at that time where he came to earth. Jesus was there at the very beginning. It reminds me when we see um, C.S. Lewis talking about the Chronicles of Narnia, that you see Aslan singing existence into the world. The very words of God is creation, is, is creating everything by the word. Obviously, that's where C.S. Lewis got it from. But it just grabs you right away. I mean, this is sophisticated writing. And again, this is written in Greek. It's, it's very dramatic. And you just sit there and you read this and you go, wow. Just wow. Jesus was there from right at the very beginning. And he is the light. When God said, let there be light, Jesus was there already from the beginning. Like I said, at some point, you get a little worried in this podcast as a lay person going, Hey, you know, I think I'm finally doing this Bible thing. Okay, we're getting through the parable. And then you hit John and you're like, oh, what got me to this point where I'm doing this podcast? Because this is deep stuff, right? So we're, but we're going to get through it. This is going to be fine. Oh, goodness. So the word obviously in Greek for the word is logos. And that's where we see a lot of things like the logos Bible study software. We understand logos is the word. I remember when I first became a Christian, I was working with a professor and she was a Christian, but she said something that was like a warning not to take Christianity too seriously. She said, some people in take the word of scripture and they put the Bible in the cradle of Christ, the word. And I thought, but doesn't it say in John that the word became flesh? Isn't that exactly where we should be? The word is Jesus. He is in the manger, in the cradle. But that, I think, comes through in John, that the word of God, the wisdom of God is Jesus. And Jesus was made man and manifested the word. One of the commentaries noted that the, that the word believe as an action verb is used more times in this gospel, more than a hundred times than any other book in the Bible. Believe, believe in the word the light. This is the point that John is going to talk about, is for us to believe. Someone else even drew this analogy that God dwelled among us. And the idea is that this is a tabernacle. The word is a tabernacle with us. So you think about Egypt, when they're bringing God in the tabernacle along with the people of Israel. And the light in the daytime, basically this tabernacle is God dwelling with his people. And Jesus is now dwelling with us, just like God was there in the tabernacle with the people leaving Egypt. John is talking, and the priests were sent, the Levites, the, the, the priest class from Jerusalem. Who are you? Who told you to do this? He confessed, but he said, I'm not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. Why well, are you Elijah? Nope, I'm not Elijah either. And Jesus will say, he's an Elijah figure for sure. Are you a prophet? No, he is. And who are you then? Give us an answer. Tell us who is doing this. Israel at this time, the word got around. And as someone is living out in the desert, John had hundreds of followers of his own. This was kind of probably making a big deal. So they sent people to figure out who is this John? Is he speaking out against us like they eventually do to Jesus? And what should we do about him? And he says, I'm the voice crying out in the wilderness, crying and yelling. Make straight the way for the Lord. It's coming out of Isaiah. Why are you baptizing, you know, if you're not the Messiah, if you're not Elijah, if you're not a prophet, 
and he says, I'm going to baptize with water. There's someone after me whose straps of the sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. It says these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. So he is calling out. I'm calling. I'm making straight the way. I'm preparing. I'm the voice in the desert, and I'm not worthy. But there is someone coming after me. People from Jerusalem, the scholars, and the priest class were wondering, who is this guy? Why is he doing this? Why is he saying these things? And why is he baptizing people? We're going to find out more about Jesus. The next day, Jesus was coming towards him, and John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Exodus, we're talking about Moses right now in Small Steps with God, painted the Lamb's blood on the door to keep the angel of death away. Now we have the Lamb of God who is going to be the sacrifice for mankind that's going to take away our death as well. He says, you know what? I'm baptizing with water so that he may be revealed to Israel. So you might see him. He says, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he is the one you see the Spirit descend and remain. He baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So we know that John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins. Mary had a cousin, Elizabeth. Elizabeth was John the Baptist's mother. Older age, John was probably on his own for a long time. That's where he started his ministry. Jesus grew up with Mary, but we don't know if they knew each other. I mean, they probably knew of each other. We don't know if they hung out. We don't really know. But this makes it seem a little bit more clear that God was told, that Jesus was going to come and have the Holy Spirit descend on him. Jesus then, the next day, calls John. Uh, so the next day, John is standing with two of his disciples, John the Baptist's disciples. He looked at Jesus and he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say that and started to follow Jesus. Now we're seeing that they understand John the Baptist is making straight the way. This is actually the real Messiah that we were seeking. So he starts following because, you know, Jesus has followers now. So that means they're following him around. And Jesus is like, what are you seeking? Someone said that this kind of question could be sort of like, what are you doing here? Why are you hanging around me? But instead it wasn't. It was more like, what are you looking for? What are, what are you trying to learn from me? And so they said to him, Rabbi, again, my teacher, where are you staying? oh, well, you know what? Come, come with me and you'll see where I'm staying. And so they came with him. They saw where he was staying. One of the two who heard John speak, followed Jesus, was Andrew. Andrew goes, we know from other gospels, runs back and grabs Simon Peter, Simon, later Peter, and brings him back. We have found the Messiah. They brought him to Jesus and Jesus looked at him and says, you, Simon, son of John, shall be called Cephas, means Peter. So he called Peter and told him what his name is going to be. This is important because he's going to become Peter when he takes the church on and brings everybody in. This is a, almost like a personal prophecy of who you're going to become. Reminds me, you know, when we have Abram and Abram is renamed Abraham. He is going to be the father of a great nation. God loves to rename people. We had Jacob, who was given the name Israel. When you are given a name by God, that is a forecast of who you are about to become. But I just love this idea that Andrew was very much involved in John the Baptist's ministry. But as soon as he sees Jesus, he knows this is the one to follow, the Lamb of God. The next day, Jesus goes to Galilee, found Philip, and said to him, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida. I think we don't know exactly where that is, but we know it's along the Sea of Galilee. I think they have a good idea now. This is the same place that Andrew and Peter, they believe they found Peter's home. So that's where P Philip was from. Philip found Nathaniel and said, we found the person that the Moses and the law and the prophets wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. I love it. Nathaniel said, can anything good come from Nazareth? <laughs> you know, I come from one of those places where you say, oh, can anything good come from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan? Ugh. You know what I mean? People look at it as a backwater. They look at it as not a place to be from. <laughs> Nathaniel fell right into that one. 
Jesus saw Nathanael and said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there's no deceit. And Nathanael's like, how do you know me? Jesus says, before Philip called you, I saw you sitting under that fig tree. And so Nathanael must have just been sitting under a fig tree. They say that sometimes people were lunching there or just sitting there and studying or getting some shade. You know, Israel is a very sunny place. I would sit under a fig tree if I could too. And he realized when he was sitting there alone under that fig tree, Jesus knew about it. Jesus says, truly I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Wow. And the translation is ESV, but wow. How would you like someone to come and say that to you? It's funny because when you look at a lot of the uh, commentaries about this, people were like, oh, well, the fig tree represents Israel. And, you know, and again, like the birds we talked about in previous gospels, sometimes a fig tree is just the fig tree. When I was in Greek literature class, we were talking about Homer, and the professor said, well, what does the scar on Odysseus's leg? So Odysseus had this huge scar. His nursemaid recognizes that this poor beggar is actually Odysseus because she sees the scar on his leg. What does this scar represent? People are like, oh, the fallibility of mankind, the fact that even Odysseus is flawed and not perfect in every way. And I'm like, how do we know that one, Odysseus was a real person and he had a scar on his leg and this is a true story, or that this is just a plot of recognition? Why does everything have to be philosophical and deep? And I think in this case, when you call the fig tree something else, I think it just means Israel's super hot. And if you can sit under a fig tree, who wouldn't sit under the fig tree? That's my take. When it says that you're going to see the angels descending and ascending, this is a callback to Jacob's dream at Bethel, that when he was fleeing Esau, that's what it's basically talking about. And when you say the Son of God, you're talking about Jesus. This is a hint that this is the Messiah. Nathaniel called him the Messiah. They knew from the beginning this was the case. I think it leaves questions in my mind about how when they lost faith late in the story of the gospel, they had it right from the very beginning. And there were things that brought them faith and brought them stronger. And there were things that scared them and brought them farther away. Someone said that having faith in God is almost like a, it me of Shrek where it's like an onion. It has layers. There's faith and there's unbelief and there's faith and there's unbelief. There are things we're really easy for us to understand and trust in Jesus And then there are things that are difficult for us and we struggle with. In this particular case, we're on the good side of the onion where everyone's like, look at that. It's Jesus. He's the Messiah. So, wow. And guess what? We ended our first chapter of John. We have survived the philosophical apostle. What I'm going to meditate on this week is this idea that Jesus was there from the very beginning. It makes me more excited for us to start covering the Old Testament, because now we're going to be able to start to see where Jesus was from the beginning. Boy, that's going to be exciting stuff. And what I'm going to pray about is this idea of timelessness, that this plan, this idea of God's was there from the onset of everything. Nothing was created apart from Jesus being the word being there from the beginning with God and as God. Wow. And what I'm going to share with other people is this concept that when we think of Jesus, something, particularly when you're Jewish, God who created the universe, God who rumbles the mountains, you know, that Elohim, this this God of raw nature. But we have to realize the Holy Spirit, bringer of life, and Jesus, the Word, all right there from the very beginning. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate listening to the podcast. We're going to get through John. And so I'm going to ask you, as always, to pray for me, pray for this to go the way that God would want us to go, that our learning about the word increases our faith, helps our understanding of God. I know a lot of times when um, Bible studies kind of first came out as sort of a popular church activity, people were kind of scared about them because What if people get the wrong idea or someone says the wrong thing? And I've been at Bible studies where people have said the wrong thing. It happens for sure. But 
can lay people at least get the general idea of what is going on in every chapter? What is our fresh take as we're reading this? And I hope you're reading along with me. Again, the goal is that you read along on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, and then Sunday we go to church. But that we can do this slowly enough so everyone can keep up. I hope that's what's happening with you and just have a fantastic weekend. Mm-hmm.